time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Another day, another Liberal energy scandal. The past seven days have been a banner week for the Liberals. $12 million wasted on consultants and advertisements. $28 million losing a lawsuit for a project that hasn't even been built. And yesterday, it was $81 million Liberal accounting error by the IESO. And today, Today, we learned that Northland Power won their court case against the government and on October 21st was awarded, hear this, Mr. Speaker, $95 million from the Ontario oh, Electricity agree. Financial Corporation. Wow. Mr. Speaker, someone has to pay for this $95 million court case. Question. When will the ratepayers learn from the government that they're on the hook again for another $95 million because of Liberal blunders? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So I know that the Minister of Energy is going to want to uh, speak to the specifics, um, Mr. Speaker, but you know, I just think it's important that we take a step back and we recognize that uh, when this government under the previous Premier came into office in 2003, we were dealing with a degraded electricity system, Mr. Speaker. There was a lot of work that has had to be done over the years to build that system up. Order, we completed the closure. I, I grant that uh, it was not the start, but we completed Stop the clock for a moment, please. Uh, during both the question and the answer, I was hearing uh, both sides uh, starting to ramp up, so I'm going to take a moment now to indicate to you that um, as soon as I said order, three more people added their voices to that instead of bringing them down. You've signaled to me that you have no intention of listening to my gentle orders. I may have to move, and I will move, to warnings almost immediately if it starts up again. Premier. Completed the closure of coal plants in this province, Mr. Speaker, taking saving four billion dollars in health-related costs, Mr. Speaker. And and you know the the opposition can heckle that, but they should talk to families of children with asthma, Mr. Speaker. Okay, I will now move to warnings. And there's two people that are brought me there. Four billion dollars in savings in health costs is not real, Mr. Answer. Speaker. But again, speak to the family of families of children with asthma. We made those changes, Mr. Speaker, and we've invested in the system that had been. Thank you. If it was a test, you're going to lose. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. I had a very specific question on the Northland case. Yet another example of Liberal mismanagement. All we hear is talking points on, on coal, which, by the way, the Progressive Conservatives initiated the phase out of coal. So, my question is about Liberal waste. It's about Liberal scandal. And I would actually appreciate the Premier could answer this. $12 million, $28 million, $81 million, $95 million, all in the last week. $216 million gone in a week because of this government's incompetence. Mr. Speaker, who is on the hook for that? Not pointing fingers, not trying to say what happened 10 years ago. I want an answer. Who is going to pay for that $260 million? Because, Mr. Speaker, it's not the Minister of Energy, it's not the Premier, it's not the Minister of Finance. They're going to make ratepayers pay again. Does the Premier not appreciate that seniors, families, businesses can't afford these skyrocketing hydro rates? <laughs> Can you see it, please? Thank you. Very good. You got the message. Don't do that. Premier. Mr. Speaker, I care very much that people are able to have clean energy, that they can have, uh, that they can afford the energy, Mr. Speaker, and that it's reliable, Mr. Speaker. And so. Nipissing Pembroke is warned. Premier. Changes, Mr. Speaker, to help people to uh, afford energy. And, Mr. Speaker, what happened 10 years ago, what happened 15 years ago does matter in terms of this electricity system, Mr. Speaker. And the Leader of the Opposition, the leader of the opposition can take a very narrow, short-sighted view and pretend that there is no history, that there is no— uh... The member from Dufferin-Caledon is warned. 
Carry on. No context, but that is just not the reality. So, Mr. Speaker, we are taking steps. We are removing 8% uh, from bills across this province, Mr. Speaker. We're cut cutting delivery charges to uh, 300,000 rural customers, Mr. Speaker, by 20% in total, with the 8% and 12%, Mr. Speaker. We are. Thank you. We are. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, it's very clear the Premier does not want to talk about the four scandals that have happened on her watch just in the last week. A $95 million court case isn't new to this government. They're used to, they're used to losing court cases. They're used to just throwing it on the backs of ratepayers. The OEFC and Northland have been battling it out in court for years. Northland is reporting that the OEFC will now appeal the result again to the Supreme Court of Canada. Millions and millions have been spent on lawyers. And what I'd like to know, we, we, we know the cost of the judgment, but Mr. Speaker, can the Premier tell us how much she has ordered the government to spend on legal fees. Please show some clarity on this endless waste we're seeing that's being put on taxpayers and ratepayers. Thank you. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm uh, pleased to rise and answer this question. Um, you know, Mr. Speaker, we are aware of this, and this is an ongoing matter, and so it is still in process, Mr. Speaker, so we can't comment on that. But what we can comment on, Mr. Speaker, is the great work that we're doing on this side of the House to help families and to help businesses right across the province, Mr. Speaker. You know, we've actually reduced bills on January 1st by 8 percent for families, small businesses, and farms. For those that are living in rural and remote areas, Mr. Speaker, 330,000 families. Wow. Those 330,000 families, Mr. Speaker, they will actually see a significant reduction of 20 percent as well. And when it comes to the agreement that the opposition doesn't want to talk about, Mr. Speaker, which is that landmark agreement with Quebec, Mr. Speaker, we're going to be bringing in two terawatts of power that will be targeted at our natural gas plants, Mr. Speaker. That will be saving, Mr. Speaker, one megaton of GHGs, Mr. Speaker. That's a 25 percent reduction, Thank something you. that on that side of the House, Mr. Speaker, they don't Thank you. New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier, and since the government won't answer a question when it comes to their latest hydro scandal, let's try a different subject. Let's try to have a conversation on mining. In May of 2012, the government promised thousands of jobs and new infrastructure for the Ring of Fire. In 2013, the budget promised to improve vital access to the region. And then in 2014, the budget uh, of the province committed $1 billion to the Ring of Fire. And then again in 2015, the same promise of a $1 billion. Surprise, surprise, in the 2016 budget, again. Sorry, stop the clock. The Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs is warned. Please finish. Mr. Speaker, I can appreciate why the government likes to heckle the record of inaction. So 2016, for a fourth time, a re-announcement of the same funds. But to date, not a single cent has gone to the Ring of Fire. The economic benefit Question. from the region and to First Nations communities is incredible. Yet this government won't and hasn't put a shovel in the ground. So, Mr. Speaker, my question directly to the Thank Premier you. is, when are we actually going to see— Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, um, I, uh, I know that the, uh, the leader opposite, the, uh, <clears throat> the leader of the opposition, um, doesn't want to recognize that the work that has been done with the First Nations community, with the Matawa uh, First Nations, is very important work that had to be done, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, the training dollars that have gone into communities, the support that has uh, already begun, Mr. Speaker, in order that. Uh, those communities can be part of the development of the Ring of Fire and can be part of, uh, of the economic development. Mr. Speaker, I recognize that the Leader of the Opposition doesn't value that, but that is the work that has been going on, Mr. Speaker. There has been a serious engagement with those communities to make sure that uh, that they are able to take part in the economic development and that as we as we put shovels in the ground and we build roads build roads mr speaker Answer. that we build those roads in a way that will connect communities so that they can yes they can be part of the economic development of the ring of fire but much beyond that mr speaker that they have the thank social you. supports that allow them to take part thank you supplementary member from Perry Sound Muskoka so 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, to the Premier. The current government has overseen the entire life of the Ring of Fire mineral deposit to date, from discovery to where we find ourselves today. Reading a press release from 2012, you would have thought a chromite mine was a done deal. The release proclaims thousands of jobs coming to Northern Ontario and has quotes from five ministers, including the current Premier. It boasts of the over 20 mining companies that holding claims in the region, a far cry from what we see today. It, it even goes into detail on a chromite processing facility to be opened in close proximity to the then minister's own riding. The government to date has truly overpromised and underdelivered on the ring of fire. So, Speaker, why should anyone believe that this government is capable, capable of doing what it takes to develop the ring of fire? Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And we are indeed working hard and very diligently to move the progress forward on the Ring of Fire. And that means, Mr. Speaker, working with all of our partners, working with industry, working with the federal government, and certainly, particularly as the Premier pointed out, working with our First Nations to move this project forward. When we signed the Regional Framework Agreement in 2014, Uh, we're on warnings. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, when we signed the Regional Framework Agreement in 2014 with the Ottawa First Nations, we made a commitment to work with them on regional infrastructure. We made a commitment to work with them on socioeconomic impacts, on resource revenue sharing. Those are all important discussions that are taking place. And may I say, discussions are at a very significant point right now in terms of them partnering with us to make some decisions related to the Community Corridor Study. May I say to the members of the opposition, if they do not believe we should be having those kinds of conversations, Answer. conversations they should say so. The bottom line is we are working hard. This is a complicated file, and we are optimistic that we will continue to move forward and see progress. Final supplementary. Again, to the Premier, Premier, I think I've heard that answer before from your minister. But Speaker, First Nation communities in the Ring of Fire region are integral to the entire development. They also stand to gain the most in local mining opportunities. Mining employs more Indigenous people than any other sector, about 14 per cent of the mining workforce. Good point. So it's important to the communities in the area to see some progress. So through the Speaker, other than framework agreements to negotiate, what tangible progress have you made on this important project? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. You said it, please. You said it, please. Thank you. That was very risky. We recognize that it's crucial that we move forward on the transportation infrastructure in the Ring of Fire, and that is indeed why we are so keen to move forward with our work with the federal government. This is a nationally significant project and one that deserves federal government support, and that's the efforts that we're making as well. But in terms of the, the work with the industry, there are still a significant number of companies that have expressed tremendous interest in the Ring of Fire. We're going to work with those industri industrial partners to help move this project forward. And in terms of the First Nations, this is an absolutely crucial part of our commitment to make sure that decisions that are made related to what will most directly impact their future development are made also by the First Nations themselves. And that's why it is so crucial that we have those discussions under the Regional Framework Agreement that will make sure that the decisions that are made Answer. are shared by our partners, not just by the First Nations, but by industry and by the federal government. We're keen to keep working hard on this. Thank you. I'm committed to it, Mr. Speaker. Stop. Minister, I stand, you sit. New question. The Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, yesterday police revealed that at least eight elderly residents of long-term care homes were allegedly murdered between 2007 and 2014 in Woodstock and London. It is horrific, it is tragic, and it is heartbreaking. And our thoughts and sympathies go out to the families and loved ones, Speaker. I understand that there is an open police investigation happening right now, and I know that no one here would do anything to impede or compromise that investigation in any way, Speaker. But there are some genuine, straightforward questions that need to be asked today. Premier, Ontarians want to know how it is possible that alleged murders can go undetected inside a long-term care home in Ontario for seven years. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, as I said yesterday, um, this is an extremely distressing case. Uh, and as I said yesterday, I don't think there's anyone in this legislature. This is not a partisan issue in any way, Mr. Speaker. There is no one in this legislature who is not distressed by this case, Mr. Speaker. And so the question that the leader of the third party asks, how could this happen, is exactly what the uh, police investigation is about, Mr. Speaker. That is exactly the question that, uh, that needs to be answered. And so we need to let the police investigation un un unfold, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, of course, there is a police investigation ongoing, and I respect that very much. But the question I'm asking has to do with the Ministry of Long-Term Care and their oversight procedures. While this is perhaps the most graphic, serious, and tragic example of, a, of abuse and mistreatment in our long-term care system, we all know that it's not the first. The families of 78,000 Ontarians in long-term care want to know what action the government has taken in the last 24 hours to ensure that their loved ones are safe. Has the Premier ordered any action or review of current oversight measures in Ontario's long-term care system? Thank you. Premier. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, let me also uh, add my deepest sympathies to these families who have not only had to mourn the death of a loved one, but now uh, face the allegations as outlined by police yesterday. It truly is tragic, and in fact, for the communities of Woodstock and London as well. Uh, I also, it's important, the police uh, uh, deliberately uh, stated yesterday morning that there's no danger to any of the residents in long-term care homes in this province as a result of uh, these uh, alleged uh, actions. Uh, we have uh, stated the same. We have one of the ro most robust oversight accountability measures to ensure the safety and protection of long-term care residents certainly in the Canada in Canada mr. speaker in fact in the world and that inspection process is robust that being Answer. said we are actively participating and collaborating with the police to ensure that the many questions including those from the opposition those questions are answered in due course thank mr. you speaker. final supplement well speaker something has obviously failed and that's the reason I'm asking the question today, Speaker. Again, it has to do with oversight, Speaker. Order. Somebody uh, will get warned if they continue. Please finish. Speaker seven years and no one knew. That's a failure of our system, and that's what I think the people of Ontario require us to look at as a group, Speaker. So my question has to do with oversight in our system, not the details of the investigation. We all know those details are going to come, Speaker. It has to do with the oversight that's needed to protect the most vulnerable seniors and residents of long-term care. There are 78,000 residents in long-term care homes across Ontario today, and they and their families have simple, straightforward questions that deserve answers from question. their government. What is the Premier doing to improve oversight and protection of Ontarians living in long-term care Thank homes you. in our province? Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think it's important that I remind all of us in this chamber that we are dealing with allegations. They're absolutely horrible, terrible allegations, but they're allegations nonetheless. And I also want to, as the police did yesterday, in reassuring the public and reassuring the residents of long-term care homes that there is no danger to them as a result of these horrible allegations, Mr. Speaker. I can also assure the legislature and the public that the highest priority for myself and my ministry is the safety and security of residents in our long-term care homes, as it is for all Ontarians. We have among the best oversight mechanisms for critical incidents as well as for general uh, annual inspections in the world, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to improve upon that strong, robust system, but it's important that all Answer. of us remind Ontarians and assure them of their safety in this uh, critical time. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party.
ask questions also to the Premier Speaker. As we continue to learn the details of this unspeakable tra tragedy and the ones before it, I want to ask the Premier very clearly, does she have faith? Does she have faith, Speaker, in the current rules and regulations? Stop the clock. The member from Beaches East York is warned. <coughs> Carry on. Does she have faith in the current rules and regulations that are currently in place in the province of Ontario to make sure that long-term care homes are safe? Are safe for the people who live there. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, I want to be very frank with the with the legislature that um, what the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care has said is exactly right. We're dealing with allegations in a very horrible, horrible situation, Mr. Speaker. Um, but there are there are processes that are in place that need to unfold. But, Mr. Speaker, if the leader of the third party is suggesting that somehow I'm not interested in getting to the bottom of this, that I don't know, I don't want to know what happened, she's absolutely wrong, Mr. Speaker. I believe that there are systems in place that are set and are, um, are designed to protect the innocence of, uh, of uh, people against whom there are allegations, but also, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that answers are found to very difficult questions. If, Mr. Speaker, as those answer. as those processes unfold, and I will uh, I'll complete my answer in the supplementary, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Sister, uh, Speaker, I agree with uh, with the Premier uh, insofar as this is a, a very tragic situation that we're talking about someone's parents, grandparents, brothers, sisters answer uncles. We're talking about family, Speaker, and that's what makes it uh, so extremely important. But Ontarians need to know exactly what's being done by the Premier to ensure that something this horrific and heartbreaking never happens again. So will the Premier be directing her Minister of Health to review how the government monitors nursing homes in this province? Thank you. Oh, as I said, Mr. Speaker, there are processes in place right now that must be allowed to unfold, Mr. Speaker. It's absolutely imperative that the police have the opportunity to do the work that they need to do to get to the bottom of, uh, of the questions that are obviously being asked by everyone, especially by the families of the people who have died, Mr. Speaker. And it is, it is the responsibility of the government and the Ministry of Health to make sure that all of the systems and protections are in place. But, Mr. Speaker, at some point, if there is a need for an independent review or an inquiry, we will absolutely undertake that, Mr. Speaker, not because of political pressure from the NDP, Mr. Speaker, but because we all need to have the answers. But in the interim, Mr. Speaker, there are processes that the police are leading, and they need to be allowed to do their work. Answer. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, these deaths are unspeakably tragic, and I can only imagine the pain that these families must be feeling right now. But it's not about impeding a police investigation, Speaker. It is not about impeding an investigation into this tragedy. But there are 78,000 Ontarians in long-term care right now, and that means 78,000 families are looking to the Premier for reassurance about their loved ones. When will the Premier be taking action to ensure that Ontario has the most effective oversight, the most effective possible oversight and monitoring of our long-term care facilities? Thank you. Premier. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, I believe that we, I know that we have one of the strongest uh, oversight mechanisms for long-term care homes in the entire world, and we continue to work to improve that. But I want to speak to the families of those uh, that are the, at the centre of these allegations, and I want to assure them that we as a government will do absolutely everything possible to answer their questions, to answer the questions that they have, that their family members have, that Ontarians have and rightly deserve answers to. And we'll do that in the context of collaborating and participating in the police investigation that is underway. And I want to reassure the 78,000 individuals who call long-term care homes their home, Mr. Speaker. There is nothing more important to me, and I give them my absolute commitment as Minister of Health to do whatever I can Answer. to ensure their safety and their security in their homes, wherever they might reside in this province, Mr. Speaker. That is my obligation, and that is my commitment Thank you. to them.
New question, the member from Leeds Grenville. Uh, thanks, Speaker. My, uh, my question is to the uh, Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Speaker, a month ago, I asked the minister to get involved in helping baby Everly Yulkowski. But Everly's parents, Sarah and Jordan of Lombardy, in my riding, are still struggling to keep their beautiful baby alive with no help from this government. It's absolutely shameful this young family is living this nightmare while health bureaucrats waste time. The minister said he's providing updates. I don't want updates. I want action to lift this unimaginable burden off this family. The CCAC has failed baby Everly. Her parents have lost trust and yeah. faith in them. Yeah. Speaker, this family is in crisis. Will the minister personally step in to get baby Everly her care without any further delay? Oh, excellent. Thank you. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate uh, this question. Uh, and uh, the member opposite knows that we've uh, discussed uh, this uh, a tiny person's uh, challenge and the challenge that it's uh, created for her family on a number of occasions. And it truly is distressing, the, uh, the circumstances that this family is going through. Uh, that's why, and I know the CCAC has been involved, my ministry is involved, my office is directly involved, uh, the Minister of uh, Children and Youth Services as well, to find a way to provide the level of support that that small uh, infant uh, deserves, and we have a responsibility to provide. We're working with the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario as well, who has aptly in a hospital setting provided extraordinary care to this uh, this tiny individual. Uh, I know that this is challenging for all involved. Uh, I'm committed to seeing it through and providing the support Answer. that that family so desperately needs. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, speaker, the bureaucrats who have utterly failed this family, yep. they get to go home at night. For Sarah and Jordan, there's no end to their day. They live this, re this reality 24-7. At any moment, Everly can stop breathing and they have to resuscitate her. It's life and death, and the stress is indescribable. These brave parents do it because they want their little girl at home. But after two months on their own, they're losing hope, they're running out of funds, and they're feeling totally abandoned by our health care system. Speaker, this is cruel, and it lacks compassion. Speaker, is this the health care system the minister wants? If not, Will he pick up the phone and call Sarah and Jordan to apologize and assure them that they won't have to go through another night Question. on their own? Minister. Mr. Speaker, this is, a, this is a very challenging situation for the family, as I mentioned. There are maybe 50 children around this province yep. that fall into a category of being uh, exceedingly, ex extremely challenging from a medical perspective. Uh, we know that this uh, tiny baby was well cared for in hospital, but appropriately, as the parents should, uh, who, as the parents want to, and we should support, they want to bring their baby home and provide that support at home. We need to work with them to do that. These are the most challenging individuals that we need to embrace that, and we need to find the flexibility to be able to provide that support. That's what we're trying to do. I'm sorry that it has taken the amount of time it has. I know, however, the CCAC has been working as challenging as this is for them. They've been working as hard as they can to find a resolution. There are num now multiple ministries involved. My office is directly involved. I'm confident that we will be able to provide the support that this young Answer. child requires, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. A member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. According to the public accounts, nearly $800 million in Hydro One cash was recognized by the Trillium Trust last year. These, quote, asset optimization proceeds were supposed to be spent on infrastructure last year. This was the whole point of the Hydro One sale. But none of this Hydro One cash was spent on infrastructure. Will the Premier explain where $800 million in Hydro One cash proceeds has gone instead of being spent on infrastructure? Oh. Mr. Finance. Mr. Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question. The member opposite, I think, does know uh, that all proceeds that are generated from uh, Hydro One in regards to the IPO and since then the subsequent uh, uh, offering. Uh, 
a good portion of that has gone to pay down the debt that's accorded to the transaction, and the rest is going directly to the Trillium Trust, which is being used for infrastructure projects in our communities, Mr. Speaker, something that that member opposite hasn't had a plan to do, and they actually have not even called for investments in some of these infrastructure projects and transit systems that are critically important to our competitiveness and enabling us to have a higher return for the use of those funds, and that is all the reason that we're making these investments and the transition from Hydro One to be reinvested into our communities. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, you actually aren't investing the money in infrastructure. But another question. When the Premier gave the privatized Hydro One a $2.6 billion tax holiday, this increased the book value of the government's remaining ownership in Hydro One by about $2.4 billion. Last year, the government rewrote the Trillium Trust Act to allow the government to recognize this gain on paper wow. as revenue that could somehow be dedicated to infrastructure. But this $2.4 billion is not cash. It exists only on paper. It cannot be spent on subways. Yet this accounting adjustment represents more than half of the $4 billion in Hydro One proceeds the Premier has promised for infrastructure. Will the Premier explain how $2.4 billion in accounting vapour is going to be used to pay for infrastructure? Thank you, Minister. May, Mr. Speaker, let's be clear. This is not a tax holiday that's been attributed to this uh, transaction. This is actually a normal course of business that's been made. The $2.8 billion deferred tax benefit actually does provide a net fiscal benefit to the province, all of which is being afforded right into the Trillium Trust, Mr. Speaker. Not only that, we have $3.4 billion thus far from the transactions that is paying down debt, and an additional $4.95 billion that's going to be going directly to the trust fund to enable enable us to do the very projects that the member opposite hasn't even planned for. We're making the plans. We're making the reinvestment. I know you're tempted, but wrap up sentence, please. They obviously don't like the fact that we're generating more funds more money to be reinvested to make ourselves more competitive. Mr. Speaker, that's what this is all about. New question. The member from Beaches East Dork. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Housing and the Minister responsible for Poverty Reduction Strategy. Speaker, according to Push for Change, it is estimated that one-third of Canada's homeless population are youth. Joe Roberts knows this reality as a former homeless youth who has transformed his difficult life to become a successful businessman, he, Joe understands the importance of the power of possibility. And since May 1 of this year, Joe Roberts, through Push for Change, has been pushing a shopping cart across Canada to help raise awareness for youth homelessness. I think I speak for all of us when I wish Joe success on the rest of his inspiring journey. Now, I know our government is committed to breaking the cycle of poverty for children and youth and ending chronic homelessness in Ontario. And, Speaker, I would ask that the minister inform this House on Ontario's progress in reducing youth homelessness. Thank you. Minister of Housing, responsible for poverty reduction. Well, Thank you, Speaker, and, and, and thank you to the member from uh, Beaches East York for that uh, important question. Speaker, I, I want to take this time and thank Push for Change uh, Joe Roberts and Marie Roberts and the rest of their team uh, and all the leaders, uh, including persons with lived experience who are fighting every day to end homelessness in communities Here across you. our great province. <laughs> Speaker, our government remains committed to end chronic homelessness by 2025 as a crucial step in showing we can and must end homelessness for everyone in our province. Speaker, since 2008, our government has made great strides in lifting tens of thousands of children and youth out of poverty. Our government has also uh, announced $15 million in additional community homelessness prevention initiative funding for the next two years for a total of $30 million in new investments to support municipalities in their local work to fight homelessness. In fact, Speaker, by 2018, our government's annual CHIPI investment will be almost $324 million. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I'm delighted to hear about the great progress uh, through our ministry and our government is making to help reduce homelessness in Ontario. And so, can't quite see who that was. 
carry on, please. Yes, yeah, Speaker. Today I had the pleasure, and I was honoured to participate in an announcement with the Minister of uh, Housing Minister responsible for poverty reduction that Wood Green Community Services would receive $400,000 from the local poverty reduction fund. And addressing poverty concerns is an issue that I brought up very early in my mandate after the 2014 election and a commitment I made to the people of Beaches, East York and across the province. So I'm proud to be part of a government that takes this issue very, very seriously and is taking action on it. So, Speaker, this funding will help evaluate the Question. program supports homeless older men with complex care needs have to transition into stable housing. Will you, Speaker, through Thank the you. Year, Speaker, will the minister explain? Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member from Beaches East York for, uh, for that question. Uh, our government is investing $50 million over six years towards the local poverty reduction fund, Speaker. This year, we're investing $16 million through the second year of the local poverty reduction fund. Over $5 million of this funding will be used to support 11 community-driven programs, innovative, measurable, that will improve the lives of those most affected by poverty and homelessness. Grant recipients like Wood Green Community Services are required to evaluate their success uh, in their program. Through this evaluation, Speaker, we can replicate success to help even more people wow. across the province. Awesome. Local community organiza organizations are helping us build the body of evidence we Answer. need to identify what's working, measure our progress, and expand our efforts to continue making Ontario the best Thank place you. to call home. Well, good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Last week, I asked the minister important questions regarding the changing dynamic when it comes to our economy because of decisions made by this Liberal government. Speaker, it is businesses like small and family businesses, startups and established manufacturing companies that are the backbone of our economy. But these very same businesses are telling us that they no longer fear their competition. Instead, it's the Liberal government that they fear the most. Speaker, last week the minister said, and I quote, no government has ever supported our small business community like this government has, unquote. Speaker, utterly out of touch. This government's haphazard policies, sky-high hydro, and lack of overall economic plan are driving businesses out of Ontario. Speaker, how could the minister claim to be the best thing going for small and medium businesses Question. when every day more and more of them are being driven out of Ontario? Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Mr. Speaker, Ontario is producing some of, if not the best, small businesses and startups anywhere in North America today, if not anywhere in the world. And rather than talk down the incredible partnership that we have with our small businesses and all the good things we've done, from tax reductions, Mr. Speaker, to leading the country, if not North America, in reducing regulatory burden for our businesses, rather than talk down those efforts, the members should be joining me in praising those small businesses, because we're proud of what they're doing in North America. Mr. Speaker, they're not only cutting edge in terms of growth, they're also leading disruptive technology in Canada and around the world, something, Mr. Speaker, that's going to lead our economy into a, a very prosperous and bright future, something that Answer. member ought to be proud of, something we're very proud of. We're proud of our small businesses, Mr. Speaker. Well, Speaker, back to the minister. While the minister brags about the government's poor record, and hands out subsidies to large multinational companies by invitation only, small manufacturers in this province are facing a crisis. The vast majority of manufacturers in Ontario employ 50 people or less, and they provide many high-skilled jobs. Speaker, sadly, I have spoken with many of these companies, and they have an eye on their exit. They have been pushed to their limit by high energy costs and see no sign from this Liberal government that their crisis has been noticed, let alone that relief is ever coming. These employers have a clear message. This government has become the greatest obstacle to their success. Speaker, is the minister saying the coalition of concerned manufacturers is wrong about the state of their very own businesses? Question, thank you. Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, we're proud of the investments we've made in partnership with our manufacturers across this province. In particular, Mr. Speaker, we're proud of the partnerships we've had with our auto sector. We've seen just in the last month alone, Mr. Speaker, the Oshawa Manufacturing Plant for GM, the largest manufacturing centre in, in all of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Because of our partnerships with GM, we're going to save thousands of jobs in Oshawa, jobs that would be gone if their leader and that party were elected. We just recently saw Fiat Chrysler, Mr. Speaker, announce that the future of the Brampton plant, thousands of workers, thousands of Ontario auto workers are there, will be saved, Mr. Speaker, because of the partnerships we've had with them. We're working hard with Ford. We're working hard with Toyota. We're working hard, Mr. Speaker, with Honda. Because of the partnerships that we've brought to that sector, Mr. Speaker, our sector in Ontario is alive and well. Thank you. If they had their way, we would. Thank you. Any questions, the member from Windsor West? Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Today, early childhood educators and child care workers from across the province came to Queen's Park to deliver thousands of signatures on a petition collected from Windsor to Wawa calling for a universal child care system in Ontario. A new report by the Association of Early Childhood Educators shares the experience of those working in a sector with low wages and limited benefits, delivering a service that few parents can even afford. What will it take for this government to finally listen to child care workers and families and commit to a system of universal, affordable child care in Ontario? Associate Minister of Education, early years in child care. Associate Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite for asking uh, this very important question. I'm so pleased to be here today as we recognize the 16th Annual Child Care Worker and Early Childhood Educator Appreciation Day. After all, the work that our early childhood educators do on the ground is so very important. After, these are the smiling faces and the helping hands that ensure that our young people are looked after. These are the people that we entrust our precious children with, the ones we put our faith in and the ones on the front lines shaping our children and future generations. So it, was, it is with great respect that I am here today to, and proud to speak out about our early childhood educators. We are providing, Mr. Speaker, $269 million to support a wage increase in the licensed child care sir. sector. We're also adding an additional dollar an hour to up that to $2 an hour for early childhood educators. This is an important sector and one Thank that you. we respect and are happy to work with. Supplementary. Again to the Premier, child care is more than a conversation of places and spaces. Parents who couldn't afford child care before this government's thrown speech are no better off today. Working conditions in the child care sector are reaching a tipping point, where over a quarter of our dedicated professionals are looking for another job. Nearly 25 per cent of early childhood educators make under $15 an hour, despite their tremendous role and responsibility in caring for our children, the future of this province. Will this government finally commit to a universal child care system that works for child care workers and Ontario families? Again, Mr. Speaker, I am pleased and proud to rise today and talk about the important work that our early childhood educators are doing. Once again, we are transforming the way that we deliver childcare in this province, transforming it. And we're transforming it with an historic investment, a historic investment not just in our early childhood educators, but also in our children and the future of this province. And how are we doing this? Well, we recognize that this means that this is about part partnerships. We are all working together to deliver the best child care system that we possibly can in this province. And that means ensuring that those people who are out there on the ground and on the front lines taking care of our little ones get the support they need. It begins with the $269 million to support a wage increase. Answer. It also goes to the dollar an hour that brings our increase up to $2, and in addition, the $10 a day to $20 a day. Thank Is there you. more work to do? Absolutely. Thank you. New question? The member from Kitchener Centre. 
Thank you, Speaker. My question this morning is for the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Ontario is fortunate to have an abundance of natural resources, including rich mineral deposits. As the minister knows, the mining industry is critical for the livelihood of many people in Northern Ontario, and it serves as an economic driver of many communities in that region. Speaker, people in Ontario want to know that their government understands this and is taking steps to ensure that our mining industry remains prosperous and on the right track. Speaker, could the minister please tell this House what the government is doing to support the mining industry in Ontario and how we can continue on the path to become the global leader in sustainable mineral development? Thank you. Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Kitchener Centre for asking that uh, very important question. And certainly, uh, Speaker, our government is absolutely committed to ensuring that our mining sector remains strong now and into the future. And that's why last December we renewed Ontario's mineral development strategy, a uh, blueprint for the mining sector's growth over the next 10 years. Tremendous uh, initiative, Speaker. And a renewed mineral development strategy means uh, tremendous initiatives like it in investment of $5 million through the Junior Exploration Assistance Program to bring forward further investment in the ex exploration, which will bring about the development of new mines in the future. In addition to that, it also means modernizing the way that we do business with legislative changes to the Mining Act that would, if passed, introduce a province-wide online claim registration and integrated land management system. Speaker, yes, I certainly can go on and on about the work that we're doing, but I'm excited to continue to working to help Ontario become the global Global leader Thank you. in sustainable mineral development. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for that answer. It's very encouraging to hear that the government understands the value of our mining sector and is continuing to nurture growth in this very important industry. But in the face of declining commodity prices, Ontarians need to know that the right investments are being made and that Ontario is working with all its partners in the mining sector. Speaker, today is a special day in the Legislature as guests from the Ontario Mining Association are visiting us. Could the minister please explain how this government intends to steer Ontario toward innovation in the mining sector and how this will help Northern Ontario's economy continue to grow? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you again to, to the member for Kitchener Centre. It was a, just a great question. And while well, Ontario's reputation as a uh, destination of choice for mineral development is very well known, we understand that the province uh, is mineral development landscape. It's constantly evolving, and there are many challenges. We are committed to helping it face those new challenges, Mr. Speaker. It's why we are continuing to modernize the Mining Act, why to, we're to ensure a fast, more efficient system is in place to promote a dynamic and competitive business climate in Ontario, and our government very much values the work that the mineral industry does each year to provide Ontario with the building blocks of a modern society in a great new industry. Speaker, as the member mentioned, today is uh, Meet the Miners Day, uh, uh, the Ontario Mining Association Meet the Miners Day here at Queen's Park. I want to invite all members, uh, um, certainly the member at uh, Kitchener Centre, and all the members of the House to visit the reception tonight in the dining room to meet the miners and tell, find out how we're building the Thank industry in the province. Yeah. Your question, the member from Perth, Wellington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. When speaking about the mess his government has made of the energy file, the minister refused to call it a crisis. My constituents disagree. In a Stratford condo building, bills have more than doubled. Their monthly global adjustment charge alone was over $2,600. Another constituent got a bill for over $100 for using no power at all. A mother contacted me. She burst into tears and was terrified after learning rates could increase twice a year. I asked the minister, if this isn't a crisis, what is it? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, a crisis is when you don't have a system that's unreliable and doesn't work, Mr. Speaker, and that's the system that they left for us, Mr. Speaker, that we had to pick up and take over, Mr. Speaker. Sure. That was a crisis. Sure. We understand on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, that there are some families that are having difficulty, Mr. Speaker, and that's why we brought forward the bill, Mr. Speaker, that's going to have an 8 percent reduction as of January 1st to help all families across the province, Mr. Speaker. We're very pleased that that bill passed last week because that will be something that's effectively going to help all families right across the province. Families 
that own their homes, families and condos, small farms, Mr. Speaker, and small businesses. We're happy to see that pass, Mr. Speaker, and we're also happy to see that there's going to be that 20 percent reduction for 330,000 families across the province that live in rural or remote parts, Mr. Speaker. And it's not just us that's saying that, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know what? Uh, the uh, CEO of the Ontario Chamber of Commerce yes, says the announcement that we made is a very significant one for residents, Hello. small industry, Beautiful. and it's the most important group that will be able to Thank benefit you. from this, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, that's not fooling anyone. Neither is this government's multi-million dollar advertising. They told us the Ontario Electricity Support Program would help those who need it, but they didn't make the benefits automatic. Instead, they forced people to apply. Be why? Because the Liberals, as usual, wanted maximum political benefit. This way, they could waste almost $12 million on consultants, publications, media and advertising. That includes $9 million to line the pockets of Liberal-friendly consultants. Meanwhile, many can't afford to keep the furnace running. That, sir, is a disgrace. Will the minister explain to my constituents why this government is using their money to sell such a scam? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I guess he doesn't understand the whole concept about the Canada Revenue Agency, Mr. Speaker, and making sure that we work with the federal government on this, like you're mandated to do, and we do, Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House. In terms of the money that we're spending on this, Mr. Speaker, we're very proud on this side of the House that $21 million has been sent, spent so far, providing support to 145,000 families in 10 months, Mr. Speaker, that we've got another 14,000 families that are signing up for this program every month, Mr. Speaker. We want more. We have a budget of $225 million, Mr. Speaker, to help families right across the province, Mr. Speaker. The unfortunate thing, Mr. Speaker, is on that side of the House, they don't talk about this program because they know it will help families, Mr. Speaker. What they like to do is just make up some numbers, Mr. Speaker. We talk about making sure that we're starting up a program that's helping 145,000 families, Mr. Speaker. We want more families to sign up, and that's why we continue to talk about it and advertise it on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker. No question. The member from Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Adam Cape has been held in solitary confinement for the past four years. Worst of all, it is for a crime for which he has not yet been convicted. He has been kept in isolation while awaiting a trial since 2012. This is our justice system in Ontario. The Supreme Court of Canada has ruled that a delay longer than 30 months constitutes a violation of charter rights. Adam has been held for 52 months. Will the Premier please explain why our justice system is violating the charter rights of Ontarians? Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Speaker, and uh, thank the member opposite uh, for the question. Uh, we are working to improve the correctional system and obviously the conditions for uh, segregation for any individual. And uh, segregation, as I indicated last week and released publicly, that this will be a uh, means of last resort and that every effort needs to be ensured that an individual will only be in segregation when it is for their safety or the safety of others in the institution. I can provide an update to the House with respect to this particular individual. This individual has been moved from their cell. Uh, they are no longer in that same cell. Uh, they are in a different location uh, with uh, appropriate lighting, access to day rooms, spending time out of their sh uh, cell for showers, phone calls, and access uh, to TV. And it is my understanding yes, that, uh, from speaking to officials, the inmate is satisfied with the conditions uh, that they are presently in. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees all Canadians the right to be tried within a reasonable time. The Supreme Court of Canada has deemed a reasonable delay to be no more than 30 months. Adam Cape has waited nearly twice that long. Can the Premier guarantee that there are no more Adam Capes that have been lost in our jails? Can she guarantee there are no more Adam Capes? Thank you. Melissa. Attorney General, Speaker. General. Thank you very much, Speaker, and uh, we uh, very much recognize, Speaker, that this is an extremely serious and, and challenging matter, uh, and we recognize that people have uh, uh, questions and, and concerns, and, and our government takes. A member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek, is warned. 
Carry on. And Speaker, I take our government takes the concerns that are being raised very seriously, and of course, obligations that are are, are enshrined with, uh, within the Charter of Rights and Freedoms uh, very seriously as well. Speaker, I can share with you uh, that, as we all know, Mr. Cape is facing some very serious charges. Uh, as the Attorney General, it is my responsibility to ensure that we do not influence the outcome of any prosecution that is uh, ongoing. Uh, but what I can say is that I've been advised that the Crown has and will continue to uh, uh, work to bring these charges to trial as quickly as possible. Thank, Thank you. you. No question. We're from Barry. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. I know that health care is a top priority for our government. Investing in health infrastructure is an important part of ensuring that Ontario patients have access to the high-quality care that they need today and in the future. York Region is one of the province's fastest-growing dynamic areas, and as more families continue to move to the area, many are wondering how the province will continue to invest in health services to ensure low wait times and access to the highest quality of care. Can the Minister of Health please update this House on an important announcement that was made yesterday in York Region. Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for this important question, and I particularly want to take this opportunity to thank the Minister of Transportation and the member from Vaughan for his tireless advocacy, if I can uh, describe it as such, to ensure that there are investments towards high-quality, uh, state-of-the-art health care services uh, in the region. Uh, across the province, Mr. Speaker, we're investing $12 billion in health care infrastructure over the next decade uh, to build new and improved hospitals. Right today, there are 35 uh, major hospital projects either under construction or being planned, but specifically about the Mackenzie Vaughan Hospital, the Minister of Transportation, a member from Vaughan, of course, was there for the announcement, as was the uh, Minister of Community and Social Services, the member from Oak Ridge's Markham, uh, and the Minister of Research, Innovation and Science, the member from Richmond Hill, all were in Vaughan yesterday to break ground right across from Canada's Wonderland. I was there last year when we announced the project uh, for the new Mackenzie Vaughan Hospital yes, site. Thank you, Minister, for that response. It's reassuring to know that our government is committed to building hospital infrastructure in the northern GTA and across this province. And I know that residents across the region are excited for the groundbreaking construction and eventual ri ribbon cutting of this very important project. I also know that many residents across the area are interested to learn about what health care services will be offered at the new Mackenzie Vaughan site. Would the minister be able to provide further details of what features the residents of the North GTA can look forward to seeing in the coming years? Yeah. Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Barrie for this question. Uh, this, uh, the Mackenzie Vaughan Hospital will be state-of-the-art. It will have fully integrated smart technology. Uh, it features systems and medical devices that communi communicate directly, Mr. Speaker, to maximize the exchange of information, to improve, uh, maximize uh, the quality of patient care and the patient experience. It's going to have 350 beds, 1,800 full-time staff positions uh, in the area, 100 physician specialists, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it will have uh, everything you can imagine. A state of the our hospital should have. Uh, by putting shovels in the ground yesterday, we took a concrete step towards providing technologically advanced, patient-focused health care to the people of Vaughan and the greater York region. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Lanark Front Athletics and Adam. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, to the Attorney General. Uh, Speaker, last week in this House, the Attorney General and I spoke about Access to Justice Week. He spoke of stats and figures, and I spoke of the human face of access to justice. We have another face who has been denied access to justice, Adam Cappy. And, um, you know, the Globe and Mail headline, I think, is important for us to understand. Ontario's sickening mistreatment of Adam Cappy. For over four years, he has been denied his freedom, denied his liberty. He has been held, incarcerated, without due process. He has been denied justice. 
he's been not denied his day in court. Speaker, and to sir, the Attorney General. A question, sorry. To the Attorney General. I heard your answer. Adam Cape needs justice. Will you stand up in this House and Thank confirm you. that he will get justice and his day? Thank you. Um, is a speaker, I would state again, uh, this is a Calling very Bob serious Branson. and challenging matter, uh, and I very much recognize that people have questions and concerns, and we as a government and I as the Attorney General take those questions and concerns very seriously, Speaker. Uh, speaker, uh, as, I, as I said, uh, Mr. Cape um, is facing some very serious charges. And as the Attorney General, it is my responsibility to ensure that we do not influence the outcome of that prosecution, which is um, on the way in any way whatsoever. What I can say, Speaker, and is, is that I have been advised that the Crown has and will continue to work to bring these charges to trial as quickly as possible. I'm not sure if... Uh a member of the uh, officials that sit in this chair should be challenging whether or not a warning is enough. <coughs> Supplementary. Speaker, again to the Attorney General. Uh, I spoke in this House about the tragedy in our justice system of 43 per cent of people who are face criminal charges kept incarcerated, who only then have their charges and their cases uh, stayed or withdrawn before trial. That's a tr terrible, terrible uh, track record of this Attorney General. And is Adam Cape going to be another one of those statistics that the Attorney General speaks about in next year's Access to Justice, and that he still languishes there without a trial? Speaker, the, the Attorney General says, He's facing serious charges. Well, I'm going to say the Attorney General is facing serious charges. For over four years of keeping somebody Question. incarcerated without the right to a trial, that's a serious charge. It shouldn't be taken lightly. He should stand up and make sure that the Attorney General's office does his job. Thank you. Speaker, the, ma the, matter, the matter is a very serious matter. The charges are very serious Senator charges. Um, I think um, uh, my advice to all members would be to refrain from um, speculating uh, as to the circumstances uh, uh, before the, the course and, and the work uh, that the Crown and the Defence Council that may be doing. I do want to address the issue of Speaker briefly, uh, the issue around access justice, because it is a very important and fundamental tenant yeah. of our justice and judicial system and the Jordan decision recently issued by the Supreme Court of Canada Senator presents a valuable opportunity uh, for our justice system. It's an, it's an issue uh, uh, that uh, all jurisdictions around Canada are, are, are discussing and grappling with. In fact, at the most recent uh, federal, provincial and territorial meeting of justice ministers, we spent considerable Answer. time talking about the implication of the Jordan decision and the strategies that we all collectively putting in place to ensure that people get speedy justice. Thank, Thank you. you. I beg to inform the House that I have laid today upon the table the 2015-16 annual report of the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.